at this time, the young people can be dismissed to the workshop. Amen. Well, well it has really been our joy uh, to have the halls with us, uh, really being reunited after about 20 years. But you know what it's like when you have a friend um, and he can be gone that kind of length of time, and then you get back together and just like it was you were together yesterday. Well, that's, that's the way it's been. And we've enjoyed uh, being with them. And, of course, they're going to stay the day with us tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that. I'm glad the weather's going to be half decent as well. So let's get our Bibles ready. And Brother Matt, if you will come and preach again to us, Brother, we're so privileged to have you. It's been a real joy. God bless you. Thank Amen. you, Brother Tom. Amen. What a joy. So um, tonight, the uh, message is going to be a little, it's a little bit different. Um, when I retired two years ago, I really didn't want my retirement. I didn't even want a retirement ceremony, but <clears throat> Suzanne absolutely insisted. She's like, no, you're having a retirement ceremony. And uh, I'm like, okay. But I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about my chaplains. I had uh, probably about a dozen chaplains there in Hunter Army Airfield. Uh, just, just great uh, men of God. And I wanted to try to be a blessing to them and, and leave something with them. And so, if you would turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> and I, I just wanted to share some things that, <clears throat> that I learned uh, over the, the last 20 years as a chaplain. Like, so, I mentioned before that I, I, um, I went in the Navy when I was 17. And I, I was in the Navy for a total of six years. And then I got out and I just didn't even think about it again. and didn't think it was ever going to go there. Um, how many veterans do we have here? All right, so you know what the DD-214 is, right? That's your real discharge papers. They mailed me some discharge papers, and I had those when uh, I joined. <clears throat> when I was getting commissioned into the Chaplain Corps, they are like, well, we need your DD-214. And I didn't have it. I only had one copy of it, and it got, um, <clears throat> uh, we, we had some kind of flooding in our house when we were in Ireland, and uh, my DD-214, um, which I'd had in the back of my wallet for years, and it just got destroyed, and they threw it away. Well, <clears throat> so then they turned out, they, they uh, <clears throat> back back in the 80s, they would, in the 70s and 80s, they, they, and it's still today, they they put a lot of our, they took our records. Everything was written down then. It wasn't, it wasn't electronic. <clears throat> and they shipped it off to St. Louis. And <clears throat> everything's like warehouse, like the big warehouse um, full of records. Well, back in 1983, there was a fire in there. <laughs> and my records got burned up. Because, well, that's what they assumed because they couldn't find them. There was no record of me having served our country for six years in the Navy. And, uh, and so I finally, I got in touch with my uh, state congressman and said, look, um, they're giving me a hard time. I had been in the National Guard for a couple of years as a sergeant, and that seemed to be fine. They didn't need my DD-214 for that for whatever reason. But in order to get commissioned, it did, because pay is different if you have prior service and everything else. So... They finally came back and they had um, they had really done their research and they did a great job and they uh, they found a copy of a copy of my DD-214 in a storehouse in Mayport, Florida. Apparently, when my ship was decommissioned, they they took all the files on that ship and they moved them into a storehouse on. Uh, a storage uh, shed in, on Mayport, and they had this. It, I have a copy of it. It's all faded out and everything. You can tell it's a copy of a copy. But then that allowed me to, to get commissioned uh, into the chaplain court. But I, like I said, I, I spent about five years as an intel analyst, sergeant, in Pennsylvania National Guard, and uh, they wanted me to become a chaplain. I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. Uh, because I was told emphatically by godly men that I respected that the chaplain corps was just a big ecumenical mess and you would have to compromise your beliefs in order to serve in the military as a chaplain. 
Well, I'm not going to compromise my beliefs for anyone, okay, ever. But if any of you have been in the reserves or the National Guard and you've done those weekend drills, you realize there's just not a lot to do some weekends. You know, you're sitting there in the army and you're twiddling your thumbs in the armory. And uh, so a lot of times the only thing to do was to sit around a table and read army regulations. Okay. Well, we were having one of those weekends and I found the army regulations on the chaplaincy, AR 165-1. Was, was our regulation. And so I started reading it. And I found in there that it was stipulated in Army regulations and in federal law that a chaplain in the U.S. military was forbidden to conduct any rites or worship uh, or sacraments except according to their faith group. And that we were, that was the commission to, to minister to your faith group. You know, well, there's, you know, most of the soldiers today, I was talking to some of the guys in the back. Uh, most of our young people who go into the military and, and you have to give a, a religious preference. And the overwhelming majority of religious preference is no preference. So that's a wide open mission field, you know, absolutely wide open. And it is incredible that the, the revivals that are going on in basic training uh, where uh, young men and women are coming to know Christ. They didn't grow up in church. They didn't go to Sunday school. They didn't have any of that background. And they're getting, they're, they're getting uh, and they, they have the opportunity on Sundays. They're not forced to. They don't have to. But they can go down. The chaplain, any chaplain worth his salt, make sure he's got lots of cookies and snacks and everything else there in the chapel. Get the soldiers in and preach Jesus. Yeah. And it's just absolutely exciting to see what's happening uh, in, in those things. I know there's a, a lot of problems with the leadership and stuff like that, but we also have godly leadership in the military, you know. And uh, for years, I, I mean, like I, I told you time and again, I thought I'd get kicked out. I, I remember, and, and Tom, Tom knows this, you know, if I'm thinking it, it's coming out my mouth. And I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of one of those guys, I have a verbal processor, you know, and it's always there. And so if anybody's within earshot of me, they know exactly where I am on any issue. I've got an opinion about everything, okay? And uh, I, have one, I had one senior chaplain come up to me the first time we served in Germany, and he said, uh, he said, man, you need to be careful what you say. I said, what are you talking about? I didn't say anything wrong. I said, I didn't badmouth anyone. You know, he said, yeah, but you know, there's people that don't like you. And I said, really? He said, yeah, well, you know, that bothers me if people don't like me. I, it, it does. I know it shouldn't, but it does. I want people to like me. He said, yeah. He said, but you would not believe <clears throat> the, the people that are protecting you that you don't even know. Because I'm preaching, I'm preaching the gospel. And uh, <clears throat> I'm taking care of my soldiers. And I won't let anyone abuse my soldiers. Uh, they were mine. If you were in my unit, you were my soldier. Okay, If you were attached to my unit, you were my soldier. You became my personal responsibility. And I would take care of them. I'd help them with their housing. I'd help them with this, that, and the other thing. You know, whatever they need. They, and if I, it, it, in my first uh, battalion, it became known that if you've got issues with anything on post or any agency, go to the chaplain. He can help you. Now, why was I doing that? To get them in so I could share Jesus. You know? You, you put a coat on them. You know, you give them some food for their belly. And then you share Jesus. You know, you get close to them. When I was um, downrange, um, <clears throat> had a, uh, we were our headquarters was it, it was it was so strange. We had an entire battalion. They took all of our companies and they they deployed them downrange under other headquarters. And they took our battalion headquarters and they put us down there. And then they put a whole bunch of other transportation companies under us. I had all these soldiers didn't know know me. I didn't know them. 
and they were National Guard. We had Air Force Squadron came down. We're running hats through Iraq. Absolutely incredible. Um, <clears throat> and they were switching in and out. And, uh, you know, it takes time to build relationships with people, you know. And so uh, I would go on missions with them. Usually they would uh, head out of uh, Kuwait up into Iraq, and they'd be on the road to, driving all over Iraq for about two weeks and then come back. So I would go out with that platoon, and we go out and live, and I'm sleeping in a truck, and it's miserable, and, you know, but I'm rubbing elbows with my soldiers, and they're wondering, you know, what's the chaplain doing? Well, he's coming along. Well, after that two weeks, I went from being the chaplain to being my chaplain. And I had made money with the entire company, even with those soldiers that I hadn't gone out on missions with. And God just really opened a door of utterance. And it was a wonderful ministry. And there's, there's, lot, there's a lot I, I needed to learn. I had a lot going for me going in because I had been in ordained ministry for almost 20 years before I went in, into, the, into the army chaplaincy. So I had a lot going, but I had, still had a lot to learn, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> but I, I, I shared this, um, there are three things that I learned as a chaplain and, and I wanted to share these with my younger chaplains, uh, before I left and in Colossians chapter three and verse 15 says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. All wisdom. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, that your word, this living document and your spirit who opens it to us that we might know you, that we might study you and know your heart. That we might have a philosophy of living life here on this earth that is pleasing to you. That we can know what's coming when the world doesn't know. Because you've revealed it to us in your word. And I pray to Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would uh, fill me, use me, help me to be a blessing to your people tonight. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alright, so um, <clears throat> there are three things. Uh, and number one was stay in your lane. One of the reasons why I recounted to you my background in the military, uh, being an NCO, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a different world when you're junior enlisted than when you're senior enlisted. And then when you're in the officer world, it's a different world. You know, I remember my son, he was graduating from college. And uh, he wanted to, to join the Army. And I said, okay. I said, why don't you go in the Air Force? They really take care of you in the Air Force, right? He's like, no, I don't want to go in the Air Force. I said, well, why don't you go in the Navy? When you're in the Navy, this is what my dad told me. When you're in the Navy, wherever you go, your chow hall is with you, okay? So, you know, go in the Navy. He's like, no, no, I don't want to go. I want to go in the Army. He goes, I grew up around the Army. And I'm like, that's right. I wasn't even married yet when I was in the Navy. You know, that's all he knew was the Army. And so he graduated from college and he enlisted in the infantry. And then he went to jump school. And uh, that's what he did. And I'm, like, and I'm saying, oh, why would you do that? Why would you do that, man? I said, look. I said, go to officer candidate school. And my, my nephew had done that. He went to officer candidate school. He graduated from there, went to ranger school, graduated top in his ranger class, 
They sent him to air assault school. Then they used him and sent him over to um, uh, uh, Sandhurst in, in Britain. Uh, because they were doing an exchange thing. He had already been uh, through college, graduated from Liberty University, and, uh, but they sent him there to do his senior year in college at Sandhurst so he could build relationships. I mean, they were grooming this kid to be a general. He had been in the Army for like two and a half years and hadn't even been in a regular unit yet. And then he, uh, then he sent him to air assault school and he deployed to Afghanistan uh, as a platoon leader. And just did phenomenal work. I'm like, why don't you do that? Do what Drew did. He's like, no, Dad. He goes, I want, it. I want to be enlisted first. I might be an officer. I'm like, why? Why would you want to do it? He goes, well, you know, I've been looking. And um, he said, the best officers were prior enlisted. I'm like, okay, you know, there's something to that, you know, bring something to it. And he said, besides, you were prior enlisted. I'm like, I didn't have a choice, man. I was a high school dropout. You know, <laughs> you've been to college. He's like, that's what I want to do. So we did, and he did really well. Um, had a tremendous testimony, uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in taking care of his soldiers and uh, bringing soldiers. Uh, he'd go to an area, and if there weren't worship services, he'd call me and say, Dad, you know, there's no place for me to go to chapel or anything like that. And I'd get on the horn. And it's usually I had a buddy somewhere in country and say, hey, you know, what's going on? You got all these soldiers up there. They, 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 don't, they don't have a chapel in providing worship. And th guess what? That next Sunday they had worship services were happening, you know. And he did that every, everywhere he went. It was tremendous. But I say stay in your lane because it, as it, when I first got commissioned, I was a chaplain. I still had a mindset as a non-commissioned officer. I was still Sergeant Hall. Okay. Uh, I wasn't, I was you know, I was pastor hall, but I was also sergeant hall. I wasn't yet chaplain hall. You need to stay in, stay in your lane. I remember um, <clears throat> they were fixing me up a, an office at the war college there in Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, they were trying to figure that, they, well, we're, we got to get office furniture and everything else. And I went to the colonel that I worked for. I said, hey, sir, don't worry about it. I, I get it. I was an NCO. I knew I could get stuff. Right? You know? I mean, you just borrow it. It all belongs to the U.S. government, right? And he pulled me aside. He brought me in his office. He, he said, Matt, you, you, can't, you can't think like that anymore. You're now an officer. You need to let the NCOs do that. Why? Because when they get caught, if they get caught, they got me to cover for them, right? I can stand there and chew them out and then pat them on the back later. But if I get caught, ooh, buddy, an officer doesn't want to get caught doing stuff like that. So there was a lot of things there I needed to learn. Stay in your lane. I mentioned to them that you may be the moral compass, and the, and the chaplain is the moral compass for his unit. But what a lot of young chaplains mistake, and even we as Christians make this mistake, is that uh, we're not the moral policemen. Now think about that. We're the moral compass. You set an example. I remember my first deployment as a chaplain. And uh, man, it was like Sodom and Gomorrah in, on this post where I was at. It was a joint task force. We had Army. We had Air Force. We had Marines. Um, and, it, you know, there was bad stuff going on. And I saw it. And I decided I was going to do something about it. And the Lord really showed me that that was not my place. Okay? I was to preach against sin. But I was not to be a pharisaical moral policeman. One of the most dangerous people on the planet is a self-righteous religious person. Who's going to force everybody else to live like them. Alright? Jesus hated those people, hated them, because they were abusive. We're there to preach the gospel. We're to show the freedom from sin. But if there was something going on, I learned, go talk to the command sergeant major. Why? He's the moral policeman. 
And so uh, I remember having a talk there. We had about five command sergeant majors, but I worked for the Joint Task Force commander, and I went to his sergeant major, and I said, Sergeant Major, you realize we got married people up there, and they're jumping back and forth in one another's rooms, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and they're doing the other thing. And so he started looking. He started watching. And I reminded him, I said, remember, Sergeant Major, you're the moral cop that we have here. And so we did. When the next command and staff that we had, that's where all of the senior staff officers come in and they're briefing the colonel. And the command sergeant major got up. He just ripped them one. He says, I know who's doing what. And you better stop it right now. Because if you don't, I'm going to come busting down the door. And I'm going to drag you before the colonel. And man, you know what? That worked. But it wouldn't have worked for the chaplain to be involved in that. All right? <clears throat> We're, uh, the chaplain is essential to good morale. But you're not the morale officer. This always happened with a lot of young chaplains. You know, they weren't busy about doing the Lord's work. They were busy about trying to make everybody feel good. You know, I remember when I was in seminary, I had to, I had to go to I had to go back to school. I had been pastor for like 13 years, but then I had to go back to seminary in order to be a chaplain in in the in the chaplaincy. So you have to have that undergraduate degree, and I learned more uh, theology in my uh, from Trinity Baptist College in Jacksonville, Florida, than I did at the seminary I went to, and it was a good seminary. You know, the academics of that place were absolutely incredible. But, um, <clears throat> uh, well, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Anyway, the, the chaplain is, is not the morale officer. Um, a lot of young chaplains, uh, the last deployment I was on was back in 2016, 2017. And I was the brigade chaplain, and I had six battalion chaplains that worked for me, and they're all godly men, which, which is incredible. It's such a blessing. You have no idea. Because not all chaplains are godly men. Yeah. Okay? And these guys were. They were preaching the gospel. But I had one, one chaplain. He was Filipino. And uh, he worked for a commander who was a born-again Christian. Uh, came to my worship services, really godly man. And he really wanted to take care of his chaplain. Uh, but the chaplain was coming up with all kinds of ideas about, you know, doing, you know, having <clears throat> skits and plays and this, that, and the other thing to kind of try to keep the morale of the soldiers up. I said, listen, chaplain, that's not your job. Yeah. Because you can get so involved in all of that stuff. I mean, Tom knows. We've been there. You want to do anything with the computer, that's all you'll do is be there and you're not preparing the word of God the way you need to. Okay? And I, and I learned a long time ago that none of us are called into the ministry to be a one-man show. And if there isn't, if God doesn't bring somebody along to do it, then you don't do it. And so... Um, I told them, and he's like, oh, sorry, I really want to do this. I said, well, then I want to know why a chaplain needs to be there. What is the spiritual element that you're bringing to it? And I said, you better have one. And so he did. He went back and he talked with his commander and everything. And he, he opened it up with a devotional from the word of God. He prayed over, you know, the little skits they were doing and everything else. And he, and he made it not just a, 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 a morale thing, but also a spiritual thing. And, 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 and he kept in his lane. And we need to think about that as, um, as Christians. Oh, I remember what I was talking about seminary. Yeah. So I had to take homiletics in seminary. Yeah. You know, I'd been preaching for how long, you know, at that time? And uh, this guy, this guy that was my uh, seminary professor, he, he had gotten saved and uh, grew up and married the pastor's daughter in an independent Baptist church. 
But he had issues with independent Baptists, style of preaching and everything else. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I preached my first message in the class, very well received by uh, the other students. And everybody in there, just about everybody in there was a pastor, pastoring a church somewhere. And then, uh, <clears throat> but it was not a Baptist seminary I went to. I went to, it was, it was a Wesleyan seminary. But it was the closest evangelical seminary to where I lived, where I could get that degree. Like I said, the academics were outstanding, and they were so respectful of me because I was your resident fundamental Baptist there on campus, and 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 they and they encouraged me and loved me, and they were they were great. But this guy had a problem with me. He didn't like my style, my confrontational style of preaching, and he brought me in his office, and he just said, "Look, you know." I, you know, you, you just made me feel like this, and you made me feel like that. And, uh, and I called him John because he told us to call him John. And I said, hey, John, you know, God hasn't called me uh, to give you the warm and fuzzies. He's called me to preach his word. You know, that guy gave me a C. Uh. <laughs> he gave me a C, and because of that C, I missed graduating with honors by .25. Okay, well, the Lord has a way of doing that, of keeping me humble, amen, because uh, it had to go right to my head, you know, because you know, sometimes I think I'm pretty great, and, uh, and God reminds me, you know, I'm nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I shared with them, staying in your lane, you must take care for your soldiers and their families. But you are not a social worker. Okay? It's where a, a lot of young men uh, really uh, get off track. I uh, remember when I was in Bible college, there was a guy who was going down, he was doing a project for one of his classes in Bible college, and it was on the abortion clinic that we had down in downtown Jacksonville. And he had really gotten involved with that thing. And he was down there every day and had gotten in with a group where they were picketing the abortion place. And he was so involved and he had gotten so distracted, he ended up dropping out of Bible college. And he had made himself ill over it. <clears throat> Listen, abortion is our national sin. It is the crime of America. And the blood of those innocent babies cries out from the ground to Almighty God. And that blood will be avenged. But you got to be careful about being, becoming distracted by issues. I had a commander, uh, one commander, didn't really have a great relationship with this guy. Um, <clears throat> you know, he came in, I, the, the commander that was outgoing, him and I were like this, you know, I mean, he loved me. Uh, he, he, was, he was Roman Catholic, but and he, so he was very reverential towards his chaplain. He loved the work that I did. And he, and he told me one time, he said, chaplain, he said, you know, if, if you weren't a chaplain, I would make you commander of one of my companies. <laughs> I don't know that that was necessarily a good thing for for to think of a chaplain, but it was a compliment, right? Then the next guy comes in, and this guy, <clears throat> you know, um, he says to me one night, and we're just, we're not clicking for several reasons, but he, he uh, he's, he's a bit of smart, a bit of a smart aleck, and he was disrespectful. And that's one thing I have an issue with, you know. Uh, I, I don't like people disrespecting me, my position, what I do. And he says to me one night, he's like, you know what? He goes, um, because we were ta I was talking about some things that was doing to help. He's like, you know, I don't really look at you as, as, uh, as a chaplain as much as a social worker. And I just looked at him. I said, sir. I've got news for you. I, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go obey any order that you give me to do. As long as it's legal, lawful. I said, but you need to understand something. I am not a social worker. I am the spiritual leader of this battalion. He did not like me standing up to him like that. 
But he didn't answer me back because he knew what I was saying was absolutely right. We need to stay in our lane. We need to remember what our task is. And that is the spiritual well-being. We need to recognize that in our families. Man, you got a job, you got a career, you're working hard. All right, remember, all right, you're, you're real. That's, that's not your life. Your family is your life. That is your responsibility. Okay? Amen. Seeing to the spiritual well-being of, of your family is the highest calling that any of us have. As moms and dads. <clears throat> I reminded them that you are the man of God, the spiritual leader for your unit. I also said, stay in your lane. Never be a problem for your commander. Be the solution while keeping your place as personal staff and as the subject matter expert on religious liberty. So what does that mean? There's, there's two individuals in a battalion or in a brigade or even in the division headquarters that are personal staff to the commander. And that is the command sergeant major, who's the highest uh, ranking enlisted member of that unit, and the chaplain. You say, well, what's the dynamic between you and the commander supposed to be? Nobody knows. Those commanders, they go to command school and they are taught about the relationship they're to have with their command sergeant major. But nobody ever brings up what they're to do with their chaplain. When I got to my first battalion, I soon realized there was nobody there that even knew what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. So I took steps to ensure that people would know that I was working for God. And so what I did was I started keeping a daily diary of everything that I did. Every time I had a counseling, every time I went down to the motor pool, was doing ministry of presence with uh, my soldiers, every, every, anything that I did throughout the day, I would start with Sunday. No, I'd end with Sunday. I'd start on Monday. And everything I did throughout the day. And then Tuesday, I do the same thing. All through the week, Sunday, preach the chapel, this time, did this, that, and the other thing. Then on the following Monday, I would email that to my executive officer, who, who was, um, he was directly over me, okay, as far as management goes. He's usually a major. I would, I would email that to my executive officer, to my, uh, to my brigade chaplain, and to the local garrison chaplain. They all had rank on me, authority over me. Was I required to do that? Absolutely not. But I wanted them to see that I was doing work for the Lord. Because I found there were a lot of chaplains. They just disappeared. There was no one to police them up. You know, in order to be a United States Army chaplain, you have to have a four-year college degree, a Bachelor of Arts degree, right? Then you have to have a, a three-year professional degree, a Master of Divinity degree, so that's like another 96 credit hours, right? Then you have to have a minimum of two years of ordained ministry experience in the local church, then you can become a chaplain, and you start at the bottom as a lieutenant, and you, but you have to go to chaplain school for three months to learn how to be a soldier. Fortunately, I'd already been one, so you know that wasn't that much of an issue. But you're looking at like 11 years of training in order to even step foot in the door as a chaplain. And so... Rightly so, everybody is expecting you to do the right thing. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't. So I ensured that my leadership knew that I was doing the right thing. What did that do for me? Well, I, I remember my, I had soldiers that were out in Grafenbeer, Germany. It was like about a four-hour drive away from where we were in Mannheim. 
and uh, they were having uh, exercise out in the field. And so I went, I went into my executive officer and I said, hey, sir, listen, um, I, I need to go out to Grafenvir. I want to do some field services for the soldiers that are out. They said, chaplain, stop. I said, excuse me? He said, look, you're the one staff officer that I am not worried about. You just do what you need to do. You're good to go. I'm like, yes, sir. And I, I did that. But that's what it did. It gave people confidence. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Stay in your lane. Work for God. The second thing that I learned as a chaplain, that you need to make ministry happen. It's not going to happen all by itself. That you, you, you have to pray. You got to be on your knees. You got to be seeking God's will. And then you need to get out there and you need to get to work. Amen? Amen. The free... The right to free exercise of religion is absolutely guaranteed in our Constitution. All right? And, and the Constitution's not giving us permission for religious liberty. It is declaring that it is an inalienable right from God. He gives us religious liberty. And that the government is not to stand in the way of that. To perform and provide religious worship services is the chaplain's Title X responsibility that is written into U.S. code. A commander doesn't have a choice whether or not they want a chaplain. It's the law they must have one. All the services have their chaplaincies. I had a lot of respect for my uh, Navy chaplain brothers that were attached to the Marine Corps uh, <clears throat> battalions. I mean, they did tremendous work. But I, I, I learned that in the Navy, chaplains are assigned, except those who, that are assigned to the Marine Corps, chaplains are assigned to a platform. Now, that platform is either a Navy base, an aircraft carrier, or some, some type of platform, that's where they're assigned to. In the Air Force, chaplains are assigned to chapels. But in the Army, chaplains are assigned to soldiers. Every unit from the battalion level up will have a chaplain. To ensure the religious liberty of those soldiers. Isn't that something? Yeah. <clears throat> I also learned in making ministry happen. The only way that's going to happen. Brother Tom. Is by empowering God's people. Amen. Mm -hmm. Got to empower people. There was places that I went. And uh. Um, you know, I'm, pre I'm preaching the word, and uh, it would soon get out that, that there was a preacher at the chapel, because a lot of times there wasn't one. They had chaplains that were in there doing something, but it wasn't preaching. I remember we, we got to Hohenfels, and it was, there was like hardly anybody in there. Uh, they had had problems with the chaplains for like the previous five years before I got in there. All kinds of issues. And so I got in there and just started preaching. I, I said, I am going to take the pulpit for three Sundays. Because I wanted the people in there to know where I stand theologically. And I had, I had three messages that I preached. They'll know right where I am on the Bible. Right where I am on the Holy Spirit. Right where I am on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvation by Him. Through faith in Him alone. <clears throat> by the time I got done those three, the chapel was packed. And then uh, somebody came up to me and said, okay, well, we would like to start a WANA program. I said, okay, well, I can't run a WANA program. You know, if I do that, that's all I'll do, right? So uh, they said, and then this man, his wife said, no, no, we want to run the WANA program. But if you know anything about WANA programs, they are, they are uh, volunteer intensive. You need a lot of people to manage that. And it's good that you have a lot of people. You had 
take care of the kids, but you got to take care of a lot of people. And I said, okay. I said, I, I, want, I want to see a plan for getting volunteers and getting them trained. And they said, okay. And then we brought in a, a WANA representative. We sat down. We came up. I said, okay, we will. This was like August. I said, we can start this program in January. Right? Why can't we start in September? I said, it's not enough time. You got to plan. You got to, you got to uh, plan your work and then work your plan. You know, so we did that. And, and that January, absolutely incredible. And it turned into, so we had Awanas for the kids. So I decided, you know what? We're going to have dinner for the family at 5 o'clock so that mom doesn't have to run home, get the kids out of school, run home, uh, feed everybody, and then try to get back to church for Awanas and, and whatever. So we did. <clears throat> Spent a huge amount of money, but God always provided it. And I, I made a deal with a local cantina, and that guy prov provided us some. He gave us a really good deal. Uh, it was about four or five euros a head um, uh, to, to feed everybody every Wednesday night. And uh, we invited the entire community. Then after, after the meal, community meal, we would then uh, send the kids down to the elementary school, which was right next to the chapel, and we had permission uh, from the commander to use the school for our water program. Man, isn't that great, right? But what did we do with the adults? Well, we started having adult Bible studies. And uh, this thing just grew exponentially. It was absolutely incredible what God was doing, okay? It wasn't Matt Hall. It was God was doing it. God was doing something there. Then I had uh, a lady come up to me and said, uh, Chaplain, i really like to start a children's church. I'm like, children's church would be great on Sunday. I said, but you're not doing it by yourself. Because I don't want the same person in children's church every week, and they're never in church, you know, here preaching. So I said, you need four people, four or five people that you can rotate. And that you can go through, and you can do that. And, and, and they made it happen. God brought the people in. It was an incredible ministry. Uh, I, think, <clears throat> I think one of the, the greatest uh, compliments I ever got from one of my soldiers, him and his family were attending there. His wife had been praying for him for years to, to, to get saved. And he did. He came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, sitting right where about you are, Tom, you know, in that little chapel there in Germany. And, uh, and we, we baptized him. His wife came up to me in te with tears one day. And I said, what's the matter? She's like, oh, you know, God is just so good. And I, I said, well, well what, what happened? She said, well, you were preaching out of Psalms this morning. And Mike turned to me and he was poking me and he said, watch, 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 watch how he gets to Jesus from here. <laughs> Why? This book is about Jesus. All right. The New Testament is uh, <clears throat> concealed in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. It is about God's redemptive plan for mankind. And that is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we as God's people are all to do the work of the ministry. Look, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, <clears throat> well, in verse 11, it says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay. If you're saved. All right, and you have surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to be serving God. You say, well, I can't do anything. Well, that's good. Okay? Because if you were talented, your talent would get in God's way. Just surrender. Just say, hey, what can I do? I guarantee you there's plenty to do. Amen? There's plenty to do. You, you come to Pastor Tom and, and, and say, you know, I really want to serve God. What can I do? I remember one time I, I was in Korea and I was the senior pastor of our chapel service there. And the Koreans loved coming to our chapel. 
And it was like packed every Sunday. And uh, <clears throat> had this one major, he was on the general staff, and I noticed this guy, he'd like come in out every now and again. If I, I went up to him, I said, hey, man. I said, you know how to use, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, PowerPoint? He's like, of course. Yeah. Any staff officer knows how to use Microsoft PowerPoint. I said, good, man. How would you like to run my slides for me? I need someone to run the slides. Somebody that I can count on. He's like, oh, I'm like, you wouldn't do that for Jesus? <laughs> and he's like, okay. You know, that guy came back to me about three months later, and he said, Chaplain, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been so rewarding. Just being able to come in here. This is my place, and doing this for the Lord, it had just filled him. It wasn't hard. It wasn't difficult. But it was necessary, and it was important. And he loved it. He loved being able to do something for the Lord. <clears throat> then I would also <clears throat> admonish my chaplains that they needed to avoid fraud, waste, and abuse. Okay? And there's plenty of army regulations. So I, I at one point uh, in my chaplain career, I was appointed as the resource manager. Because all the offerings in the chapels across the world, they are collected and then they are managed by the chaplain corps. All right. All the, these, and these are considered non-appropriated funds. In other words, they're not tax dollars. They're God's people giving offerings to the Lord. But the army has a whole slew of books on how to manage that. And I soon found out that the army regulations on those finances didn't allow me to spend any of it. I mean, if you take the letter of the law, there was no way to spend anything on anything. And then I came to the realization, I wasn't there to look at the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. Because there were, and what was the spirit of the law? That you didn't steal God's money. That there wasn't any fraud. There wasn't any waste of God's money. There wasn't an abuse of those offerings. And I, I had gone into situations where I was uh, talking to the women of the chapel. Because we always had ministries like that. And the previous chaplain before me wouldn't spend a dime on anything. And those ladies couldn't do anything. And they had, they had a place in the budget. And I sat down and uh, with, with those ladies, their, their leadership, and they're like, uh, well, Chaplain, you know, we would really like to do this. I said, that's great. Let's do it. And they're like, really? I said, yeah. And I said, um, and they're like, well, can we do this? I said, well, let me ask you, is there any fraud, waste, or abuse involved in that? And they're like, oh, no, absolutely not. I, Let's do it. Spend it. You know? God's people don't give money that it goes sit in a savings account somewhere. Right. It's to do the, the Lord's work. Right? right? Yes. When I got there, the offerings um, from that particular uh, chapel in Hohenfels, they were going up to Grafenbeer. They were taking our money up there. And the garrison chaplain in Grafenbeer was spending our money. Now, he was my boss. He was a colonel. I was a lieutenant colonel. So I went up and I sat down with him and I said, sir, you're spending our money and that's wrong. And he's like, well, you know, I have authority. I said, and our offerings were a pittance, okay? But they were collecting because the guy before me wasn't spending anything. So he was taking the money and he was using and spending it on trips for soldiers like out to Normandy and France and stuff like that. None of our soldiers were going, but they were up in Grafenbeer. I'm like, that's wrong. That's an abuse of our offerings. Well, as soon as I said abuse, man, his antennas went up. <laughs> he didn't realize I, had used, I used to be a resource manager, you know. So I'm like, sir, um, you know, we're going to have to call the chief's office and have me assigned somewhere else uh, because uh, I'm either the garrison chaplain down there or I'm not. And that means I have effective control of those offerings 
and no one else does. Well, I see, I had been there for a little while, and I had turned everything around, every, or God turned everything around with me being there. Man, he did not want me leaving. He said, Matt, anything you want, anything you want, you got it. Well, then I went back and I reported to our congregation. I had, I had a talk with the garrison chaplain in Grafenbeer, and I have secured the fact that, only, uh, that our offerings will only be spent in Hohenfels. My, our offerings increase from about three hundred dollars a month to three thousand overnight. Why? Because God's people had confidence that there was no fraud, waste, or abuse with God's money. One thing, I mean, you know, with Tom and I were missionaries. You know, a lot of times, you know, it was just us. But one of the very first things I never wanted to touch the money. But sometimes, when you're starting out, you have to. But I always made sure that I couldn't spend it. That there had to be several signatures on any checks or anything like that. And that uh, I would help count the money, but somebody else would deposit it in the bank. And then as soon as I could, as soon as we had people in place that they could take that over, I stepped away from it. And as a chaplain in the United States Army, I never touched a nickel. Ever. I didn't count offerings. I didn't make deposits. I, I controlled the spending of it. Okay. But those the signatures for those checks were other people. So that God's people had confidence that God's money was secure and being used for God's work. Amen. <clears throat> and then the last thing I shared, and I, and I hope this is helpful to you. I know this was to some chaplains, but... Uh, a, a really good um, businessman friend of mine, he was at my retirement. He said that this was a blessing to him. So I wanted to share this with y'all. <clears throat> the last thing I shared with them, the third thing that I learned as a chaplain is that own who you are as a chaplain. And what do I mean by that? Chaplains are a minister of religion. They are, you can't be a chaplain in the United States Army unless you were endorsed by a faith group to serve as a chaplain from that faith group, okay? So the Baptists will have a Baptist endorser that will endorse us, and that endorser has the equivalent, he's a civilian, but he has the equivalent rank of a, of a Fulberg colonel, the authority of a Fulberg colonel, okay? He doesn't have the rank, but he has the authority. And then you're also respond. You're an officer. You're a soldier. You wear the uniform. You're responsible for going to PT, uh, taking care of soldiers, making sure you do all. You, you know, you have to. You have to know how to march. You have to know uh, how to talk. You know, you, I mean, your uniform had to be good. <clears throat> I remember when I um, when I went in to uh, see this commander. When I got to my first battalion. I reported to the XO because, you know, I was, you know, I, he, the, the executive officer controls all the uh, battalion staff um, as far as administratively. But I answered to the, the colonel. But so, I, you know, I paid visit to the XO. I get in there, and these guys were like a bunch of pirates. They really were. I mean, this guy, he's got his... his his, his boots off, he's got white socks on, his feet are up on the desk, he's sitting there in a t-shirt, and uh, uh, the captain that I was with who was bringing me in, uh, you know, introduced me, and he's like, uh, sir, this is Chaplain uh, Hall, and he says, chaplain, chaplain, oh, we don't like chaplains around here, and I just looked at him, I said, is that right, sir? I said, well, you're going to love me, and then he sat up. He kind of liked that. He says, okay. Um, gave me some, you know, little welcome and everything. Then the next day, I, I saw him. I had, uh, I was trying to go see the commander, but the guy was avoiding me like the plague. I finally cornered him in the chow hall. And, uh, you know, he left me at, at attention the whole time at his, um, at his table while I was talking to him. And then the next day, the XO came into me and he says, uh, 
Yeah, don't don't talk to the commander. I said, what are you talking about? I'm personal staff to the commander. He said, yeah, but ch- commander doesn't like chaplains. And uh, so don't talk to him. You can give him the greeting of the day if you see him, but other than that, you come to me. And I said, man, that's a load of garbage. He said, what's the matter, chaplain? I said, what do you mean, what's the matter? I said, I guess I should have taken that other battalion that they, they offered me down in Italy, huh? He's like, you know, he's acting like, oh, I don't get it. So then I show up for PT. You know, you guys, you know, you go to PT in the morning, right? You have formation, do, do your PT. So as a chaplain, the chaplain's assigned to headquarters company. I went to, formed up for PT with headquarters company. And then after, um, you know, we do the initial stuff and we're breaking up and to go and do the PT. After formation, the XO walks up to me and he says, hey, chaplain. He said, yeah, don't, don't come to formation with headquarters company anymore. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm in headquarters company. He said, yeah, but the colonel doesn't want to see your face first thing in the morning. (laughs) Oh, man, I was hot, you know. And uh, I'm like, okay, whatever. And so I decided, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to PT with a different company every morning. That's what I did. And I endeavored, I'm going to be, I figured, okay, this is it. This is my last assignment. My first battalion, my last assignment in the Army. All right, I'm going to go out with a bang. And so I, uh, <clears throat> I determined that I was going to be a mentor to all my company commanders to help them, to advise them, to give them the best uh, advice to be the best commander they could be. And then the, the first sergeant, I was going to be the first sergeant's best friend in the whole world. See, I had both. I mean, I was an officer, but I was also prior enlisted. So I got both mindsets, you know. And I know the pressures there are on those senior NCOs. That's probably the hardest job in the Army is to be a first sergeant of a company. <coughs> it, it is very difficult work. And so that's what I did. Every morning. And I made friends with all the company commanders. You know, I'd go by and see them every day. Go see the the first sergeants. they see me. They'd smile, you know. I'd sit down, talk with them, able to advise them. And why was I doing that? Because my ministry was the soldiers. But the commander and the first sergeant were the gatekeepers to the soldiers. So by developing those relationships... I had ministry to the soldiers. Everybody was inviting me out to, their, to the field. Everybody was inviting me to go on runs with them. Everybody was inviting me down to the workspace where I could go around, you know, rub elbows with the soldiers, pat them on the back, and they got to know their chaplain and building relationships. Why? So that I could share Jesus. <clears throat> then I was there for about three months doing that. And uh, my brigade chaplain calls me one day and he said, Matt, have you ever had a sit down with your battalion commander? Now, every commander, has, he has officers that report to him. He has to have a face-to-face sit down with that officer, you know, within 30 days of that officer's arrival to his unit. Well, I wasn't even allowed to talk to this guy. <clears throat> now, he was being a little... KG, because I had come there from my posting at the war college. Well, you know who was in my chapel at the war college? All the brigade commanders that were there. And they knew me. I remember being in Iraq, sitting, having a chat with my soldiers, or some full bird coming up, and I didn't even know the guy. You know, I'm standing up to the tent. He's like, oh, no, no. He's like, Chapel Hall, just relax. He's just want to say, I was there for the last message that you preached in chapel at the work college. It really blessed my heart. Thank you so much. This was happening everywhere, even in Iraq. You know, that was pretty cool. Now, it was also it was also a, a tentative situation because you don't use those relationships. My loyalty was to my battalion commander, who was a lieutenant colonel. Our brigade commander out in Kaiser Slaughter. She was in my congregation back in Carlisle. And, but 
I never talked to her. Never went to see her. Because my loyalty was to this commander. Even though he had no loyalty to me. That didn't matter. And so my brigade chaplain says. He, hasn't, he, he was really mad. He's like, okay, I'm going to take care of that. About 20 minutes later, I get a call from the, the XO. He said, uh, hey, chaplain, 10 o'clock Tuesday morning. You got a 20-minute interview with the colonel. Don't be late. So I wasn't. You know, I was there. And I sat for 20 minutes outside his office door until he, and he knew I was there. His people, you know, secretary told him I was there. I just sat there. And then he finally, he opened up his door at 10 o'clock on the dot. He's like, hey, chaplain. Uh, yeah, come on in here. We sat down. He was from Boston, and I'm from Philly. And our personalities just clicked, you know? We both had that, that thing going on, <laughs> you know? That undefinable thing. Yeah. And he sat there, and he's, he's like, Chaplain, I got to tell you, I didn't want to like you. Now, I didn't know why. It turns out he had a spiritual issue. He was Roman Catholic, and he had gone in an argument with his priest, and, and, and then he, and he, and he cussed at his priest during that argument, and then the priest damned him to hell. So now he had a problem with God. Listen, as a born-again Christian who is saved, has the Holy Spirit living in you, you represent God. And a lot of times, the things that you'll go through people despising and hating you it's because they really are mad at God That's right. That's right. but you're is all, you are all they see of God that's hard sometimes but it's the reality we sat there and he said but look chapel I got to tell you every single one of my company commanders and every single one of my first sergeants have been in here telling me what you're doing for our soldiers Two hours later, I had a 20 minute, two hours later, we come out of his office. He's got his arm around my shoulder. He's like, chaplain, you're the only staff officer that's allowed to come directly to me. And, you know, God did that. God did that. I'm like, well, well praise the Lord. I ended up getting the best officer evaluation report of my entire career from that guy. <clears throat> Own who you are as a chaplain. Who am I as a chaplain? A Jesus man. I represent Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. You know, we need to own who we are as Christians. Don't be ashamed to be a Christian. You don't, you don't have to be shoving the Bible down people's throats. But your walk, your talk, your worldview should be biblical. You see, our weapon, our offensive weapon as Christians is what? It is the sword of the Spirit. I... I, I <clears throat> And, and, and what's <clears throat> the word of the Lord, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the Lord, right? It says there in Ephesians. <clears throat> you know, uh, what's, <clears throat> what's translated the word there is not logos. It's rhema. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's the spoken word of God. That is the sword of the Spirit. How do we speak the Word of God? By internalizing the Word of God. How do you internalize the Word of God? You've got to study the Word of God. You have to read it every day. It needs to be part of your food every day. Get in the Word. Let it consume you. And then when you are out there living life, the Holy Spirit will use it. He will use it. It will pierce hearts. 
uh, a lot of times my soldiers, they would come in to me for counseling, and uh, I've had every, every kind of religious background soldier come to me for counseling. I've had Muslims come in. I've had Buddhists come in. I've had, I had uh, one kid, he was seventh generation pagan. And he came to me for counseling. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just a little confused. I said, would you like me to get somebody of your uh, religious background to provide you cancer? Oh, no, chaplain, I want you. I said, why do you want me? Oh, I trust you. And I'm like, well, amen. Thank you. I, I'm good. I said, but you know what this means right here? And they'd always say the same thing. They'd say, that, well, that means chaplain. I said, no. It means Jesus. I am a Jesus man. Now, I'm not going to be sitting here. We're, we're not a church service. We're not going to be shoving the word of God down your throat. But you need to understand that the cross will inform my counseling. The word of God will inform my counseling. And God will be part of the conversation. I've never had anybody walk out. They appreciated me being honest and upfront about that. They knew exactly what they were getting into. Now, did all those soldiers get saved? No. I was able to help. Probably 99% of them, okay, with their issues that they were having. But many of them did. I remember they are canceling this one young girl. Oh, bless her heart. She, had, she came from Tacoma, Washington, at where, near where TJ lives. And she just had a bad time. Her husband had committed adultery and left her. She had a little baby boy, and she joined the Army so she could feed herself and her, her little boy. But she was a very junior rank, and she wasn't able to bring her son with her yet to where she was. And we're there in Germany. And she's pouring out this horror that had been happening to this girl in, in her personal life back home and the family and everything else. And I'm sitting there listening to what she's telling me. And I'm just praying. I'm like, God, I have absolutely no idea how to help this girl. I got nothing for her. And it was like, you know, that still small voice, just um, tell her about me. And so I said, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I was getting teary-eyed listening to this poor girl. My heart was broken for her. There was nothing I could do for her. And I said, I am just so sorry of the things that have happened to you. I said, I really don't know what I can do to help you. I said, um, but would you like to know what the Bible says about salvation through Jesus Christ? Oh, she said, oh, yes, sir. That's why I'm here. She didn't say that, you know. I was like, oh, praise the Lord. And she got saved. Amen. You know, I, I ran into her in al Assad, Iraq, a couple of years uh, later, uh, maybe a year later. And she was a sergeant at that point. So, uh and uh, I, t I was talking to her, and she was able to get her son. Her, her ex-husband had been trying to get custody of their son. She was able to go back, and the courts awarded her custody of her son. And he was being taken care of, and she was down there. And uh, the Lord was just taking care of her. Amen? Amen? You know, you don't have all the answers, and I don't have all the answers. And we were never meant to be. Okay? But Jesus has all the answers. Amen. God can do something. <clears throat> then uh, a lot of times I go somewhere and every day somebody, usually a little snarkily, will say, hey, what's the word, chaplain? So I learned very quickly, I better have a word. That's a good principle for all Christians to have. Just to have a word from the Lord. You know, I, I, I came out of church... Um, about six months ago, I went down to Lowe's to get something. I was coming out, and you know, and I, I had a sport jacket on, a tie, pants, you know, coming out of there and carrying some stuff. And there was these six uh, <clears throat> young men that were around this um, pickup truck, and they were loading it up and everything. And one of the one of the guys, he just says, he's he's like, hey, sir, um, he was, uh, what kind of business are you in? And I said, what, I look like I'm a businessman? Uh, yeah. And I said, well, I, no, I, I said, I'm a pastor. I said, you're a pastor? I said, yeah. And they were like, uh, well, you got to work for us. And man, my, my mind just totally blanked. 
except for the text I was on that morning in Psalm 2, okay? Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. And I preached a little two-minute sermon to those kids, and they all got very reverential. The Holy Spirit used that word, the rhema of God. Kiss the Son. I said, that's not the Son up in the sky. That's the Son of God. That's Jesus Christ. I said, you know Jesus came. He was a little baby, and then he grew up, and he died for our sins on the cross. But he's coming again. He's not coming back as a little baby. He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, to execute wrath. I said, you do not want to be on the wrong side of him when he gets back. You need to know Jesus. And then I think, I said, guys, thank you so much. Let me preach a little bit here to you. I really appreciate that. And they're like, oh, no, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Really appreciate it. But I could just see. I mean, that was a word. Now, what I determined as a chaplain, there was a guy on Southwest Radio Church. Anybody remember Southwest Radio Church? Man, I love that guy. I can't remember his name now that was on there. But he said the same thing opening up every day on, on the radio program. And he said that uh, God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. I kind of adopted that. And so that was my word. You know, I mean, just offhand. Now, I soon, you know, just got a little notebook and I started putting little quotations in there with, along with a, a scripture verse. So that I always have a new word for someone who had wanted a word before. And God used that. He used it mightily. It was so simple. It was so easy. There was no effort. There was no, there was no anxiety with it or anything like that. Just giving people a word. It changed, it changed their day. For some people, it ended up changing their lives. It's so simple. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, <clears throat> the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We own who we are as Christians and, and chaplains, okay? We can own who we are as a chaplain, but also as Christians by having a proper fear of God. All right, I, I, I really do not like this, this whole movement of just making Jesus my buddy. Amen. You know? Amen. Jesus says, I have called you friends. But you should say, I am but an unprofitable servant. We should have a proper awe and respect of Almighty God. That doesn't mean that we go around trembling. That means an awe of Him, of His majesty. Of his glory. You have an all of God. I had a friend of mine. Jerry Sutek. Remember Jerry? Yeah. Alright. <clears throat> this guy was a street preacher. Uh, I met him. He, he did street preaching all over the United States. And he came to Northern Ireland. And he was in a little church down in Ballymena. And I had a copy of one of his books. He wrote books on street preaching. And uh, I was reading his book. And it was prefaced by the uh, president of my Bible college that I'd gone to. And, you know, who was recommending this guy. He actually came up at Trinity Baptist Church. He had gone off to Bible college. Uh, he uh, then was pastoring a church in Tallahassee for some years. And then his wife left him. His kids all turned against him. And he was out of the ministry. He was back in Jacksonville in his mom's room. And the room that he grew up in as a kid just totally destroyed and distraught. Not knowing what he's going to be doing. He said one day his mom just came in there and said, um, you know, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You know, God, God's called you to preach. You need to get out there and preach. He goes, where am I going to preach? She said, anywhere. Just go do it. So he got himself a little pickup, put a sign in the back of it, and he started going out on the streets doing street preaching. Did street preaching all over the place. I read that book, and man, it really convicted me. And I'm not saying everybody should go out and preach on the streets. But I needed to. I read that book, and so I called him up, and I said, Hey, uh, Brother Sutek, I'm Matt Hall. I'm up here. I said, I'm really interested. I read your book and stuff. He said, Hey, why don't you come on down? And I said, That would be great. So I went down, 
And I met him uh, on the third, I think the next day, uh, went down to Ballymena. It was about a 45-minute drive away. And Jerry had, uh, he had gotten himself an accordion, and he taught himself some chords on the accordion. Wasn't really a musician, didn't have much of a voice, but he would strap on that accordion. And I saw it sitting over in the corner, and we talked a little bit, and he said, he said, come on, come with me. And he grabbed the accordion, and we went out on the street. Strapped that accordion on, and he just started playing, singing, singing hymns, walking down the street, singing hymns. It's like, wow. I'm like, okay. And then we got up to the corner near the mall where there was a lot of foot traffic and people going back and forth, and Jerry stopped, and uh, he preached, he preached the Word of God. And he had given me some tips. He said, every sentence out of your mouth needs to contain the gospel, okay? Because that's all any one person's going to hear is one sentence, and they're going to be gone, you know? So it needs to. But, you know, if you study in the Word of God, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the door... I will come in and sit with him and him with me. I mean, the gospel is all there in, in these little phrases, right? And so uh, Jerry got up there and he got done preaching and we sang a couple more hymns. I'm like, this is great. I really am. And Jerry turns around to me and says, okay, you're up. And he walked away. And I got to tell you what, I was panicking. I was panicking. I must have turned white as a ghost. And I stood there. And I was afraid. And then he, he looked at me for a couple of minutes and he came back. He said, hey, man, he goes, don't, he goes, don't, don't feel pressured to do this. I said, yeah, but God wants me to. He said, then you better do it. And I did have my little New Testament, cupped it to my mouth. And I said, the Bible says. And for the next 10 minutes, I was preaching to God. And all that fear, as soon as I, the first word came out of my mouth, right. all the rest of it was gone. What was that fear? It was demonic. Because the demons of hell didn't want me preaching. All right? Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. Amen? But of love, power, and a sound mind. <clears throat> and so we're not to fear anyone but God. And... Jerry had this saying, and it, it, it is a, a wonderful truism. Fear of anyone but God is a sin. And so I'm in battalion's, uh, <clears throat> battalion staff meeting, you know, one day, and our battalion commander comes out there. Uh, <clears throat> well, we hear him out in the hallway, and he's just pitching a fit. He's in a rage out in the hallway. And he's yelling and he's cussing. This guy had one of those really deep baritone voices. And he's yelling and cussing. Uh, and the sergeant major had said something to him out there. And he was in rage. And I had heard this guy could fly off like that. You know. And I had determined I wasn't going to take the abuse. I'd get up and walk out. He started cussing me. Yeah. <clears throat> So he's yelling, and then he comes in, and, and the sergeant major didn't even bother coming in. He just went the other way, you know. He didn't want any part of what was going to happen next. And so you had all the commanders and the first sergeant sitting around the table, and then you had the staff officers around, around the edge. And uh, he starts pointing at, at, at all the commanders and the first sergeant. He's like, are you afraid of me? And they're, and they're all like, he's like, are you afraid of me? Are you afraid of me? Are you afraid of me? And then finally, his finger pointed at me. He didn't look at me, but his finger pointed at me. He said, are you afraid of me? I got on the edge of my seat, and I said, no, sir. Man, you could hear a pin drop in that place. One of my first sergeants that came to my worship service, I could see he just started praying. <laughs> He's like, oh man, the chaplain's going to be dead. <laughs> oh dear God. One of my lieutenants, she was over there. She started tearing up and just shaking her head like, oh no, our poor chaplain. And then I looked at him and I said, and he's still not looking at me. And I'm looking at him. And I said, fear of anyone but God is a sin. And they're like, oh, everybody's like, oh. 
he looked up and he pointed at me. He's like, that's good, chaplain. I like that. And he calmed right down. And that man never again lost his temper in front of his staff or his officers. I figured my career was over. But God used that because I had determined, thanks to Jerry Sutek, I wasn't going to be afraid of anyone but God. Amen? Amen. I hope that was helpful to you all. Uh, it went a little longer than it went for my chaplains that I preached it to. Uh, but uh, are we done, Tom, or is there a few minutes? Do you want to let people ask questions? Or no? Yeah. So what I had thought that um, I would do that, I really figured I'd be done in about 15 minutes, and that, that didn't happen. you know. But uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity. If anybody has any questions... Uh, about the, the chaplaincy, what's going on in the Army, or anything like that um, that, you know, that you would like, like to ask. And, you know, I, I don't know if I'll have an answer for you, but you know, I could try. Sir? This is not about the chaplaincy, but it's about dealing with chaplains. And you, know, you, you talked about that story about the uh, battalion uh, colonel, standing officer. And what that chaplain priest told them was not the truth. Oh. Absolutely. How, how do you explain to someone who comes from a, a Catholic mindset that that man, that priest had no authority to damn him to hell? Well, first of all, I don't have to explain that to him. Unless he asked me. You know. Um, but, you know, you have a bunch of Baptist preachers saying stupid stuff, too. You know, happens all the time. Um, people are responsible for their leadership, their spiritual leadership, to follow godly leadership. How do you know if that leadership is godly? Well, you need to know the word of God. Okay? That guy didn't have the authority to do that. Catholic Church doesn't even give him the authority to do that. You know? But um, he had to learn that. He, and it took a while. I never had a spiritual conversation with that man. Because that was up to him. He had to invite that. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. But I did set an example before him, and he changed his attitude towards God. I know that. I, I struggle with dealing with Catholics because they're so entrenched in the authority that they're used to, and I, I struggle to differentiate the true authority that God has and his true belief mm -hmm. in the real God. Yeah. You know, I, I know a lot of Catholic priests, you know, and some of them, they, you know, they they're all over the place theology, theologically, just like Protestants are, okay? They really are. And I, I know some Catholic priests that are born-again Christians and preach the gospel. I've met them. I've known them. I know that's not the dictates of the church. But what I found, when I was brought on active duty by an Irish Catholic priest, I figured, oh, man, this guy's Irish Catholic. There's no way, you know? Because we're, we're Irish Protestants. Right? That's, that's the mindset we grew up in. Guy loved me. Thought I was great. You know, because we think differently in America about those things. And, um, and, and, and he was good. He was very respectful of where I was. He appreciated the way I handled the Word of God. You know, um, I had Catholic, you know, when I grew up, got up in rank, I had Catholic priests who worked for me. Some of them were outstanding, and some of them were absolutely worthless. You know, but it was the same thing with the Protestant chaplains. You know, you get you get good eggs and bad eggs uh, there too. You know, it wasn't my job to get into a theological debate with chaplains of other. Now, sometimes we did if if we both wanted to go get coffee and and have a uh, debate, <clears throat> or not a debate, but a discussion. And uh, <clears throat> I I had, I mean, my two my two best friends there in Germany. One was Catholic priest. One was a uh, Jewish rabbi. And they loved me. They loved me. When I get up to do a devotion for all the unit ministry teams, they're like, Matt, you're going to do the devotion? Absolutely. It was all about Jesus every time. And they appreciated the fidelity that I showed to my calling. Um, I don't know if that, that's helpful. But I also believe that God... When you're in a situation with somebody and you don't know and you don't have the answer and you don't, and there's no way for you to get the answer, 
You can pray and ask God for wisdom. And he'll give it to you. You know? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. You know, God will, I, I've seen that happen over and over again. We're in the moment, I'm just praying, God, I don't know what to do. And then, all of a sudden I know what to do. It's not magic, it's not a voice, but the Holy Spirit lives in us. And he loves that person more than you or I do. Yeah. And he will use you if you have a proper fear of God and a willingness to be uh, kind to people. Now, I think that's the real secret. We need, we need to be kind, you know? I know I'm talking all this blustery stuff and everything. You know, I don't like bullies at all. But, you know, um, <clears throat> most, most of the day is just being kind to people, right? Just being loving. And people appreciate that. Uh, any other questions? Y'all are ready to go home, aren't you? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I just want to say, had a lot of things going on this today, and I really just didn't want to come to church today. Y'all. Lord, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> We needed to meet today, you know? I mean, we are brothers in Christ, but also kindred spirits. Me and this man have been the same places, knew the same things, lived the same life, you know? And what a blessing, refreshing blessing it has been to get to know you, brother. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Cool. Amen. All right, anyone else? Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Pastor.